in Dr. Sorensen's Harley Street surgery, surrounded by biotech apparatus and succulents curated by Insta influencers Boys With Plants. Lucy Shipman is absent-mindedly chewing on a cup-fee edible mug while reading How to Raise a Plant and Make It Love You Back as her soon-to-be ex-husband, Martin Shipman, sips the survival juice that his coffee-maker phone case has squirted out and daydreams he's a deep-sea cephalopod emitting an inky, caffeinated distress signal into the tank he's trapped inside of. A narrow, aquatic coffin in a cuttlefish cuddle cafe for lonely Londoners who want to snuggle a squid as they gulp down friendly microbes from the lactobacillus menu. Stressed marine mollusks inking in captivity blast their bodies against the walls of the aquarium. Shattered. The Cuttlecalf staff are cleaning Martin's coagulated gills so that the build-up of the ink he's spewed from his anal mantle doesn't suffocate him. But this is all just a metaphor. Or transubstantiation. Water to wine to coffee to cortisol to ink. And Martin is just a man who is getting divorced. What's the opposite of fiancé? A man I'd first met years ago when I found his corporate ID card at the bottom of the big escalators in Jubilee Place. The card said that he was lead software architect at Citibank. I'd read the job title as lead architect at first and thought it absurd that someone might specialise in constructing buildings from the softest metal. Lead architect, low melting point, threatening liquidation like the way the evening reflections turned city group tower to metallic goo, emulating silver halide film stock with too much gelatin emulsion so that the spectres of passers-by slid off glazed walls into a slimy primordial soup. And here we find him, a decade later, sitting in his plastic surgeon's office with his almost ex-wife, wishing he were an octopus so that he could squeeze his whole body into his own nostril and disappear. Animals as we know them arose from one cell whose clone daughters didn't separate properly during cell division. And this is how Martin's wife Lucy felt about their relationship. As they sat in Dr Jesper Sorensen's consultation room in Harley Street, they were like two lone cells forcibly clumped together, wishing billions of years would slip by so that they could evolve into a filmy, globe-like form which would one day grow the kinds of legs that would look great in the kelp leather Gymshark branded activewear that Lucy was browsing in her copy of Practical Paleo magazine. But Lucy couldn't wait billions of years. Like Dr Sorensen, she was effervescent and assertive. Martin, on the other hand, felt alone, a shy helium atom unreactively floating about in an atmosphere of bubbly oxygen and hydrogen particles, keen to form water. Lucy and the doctor bonded flirtatiously over the bio-divorce documents they'd drawn up. The documents explained that microbial communities vary greatly between different households, but are similar among members of the same household, even pets. Now that Martin and his wife were separated, they'd asked their plastic surgeon, Dr Sorensen, to restore their individual biomes so that they could get on with their lives without that clingy craving for bacterial familiarity that had drawn them back together in the past. The doctor had suggested giving them entirely new biomes via faecal transplantation, bacteria therapy, the transfer of stool from a donor into the gastrointestinal tract. And when he offered Lucy his own faecal matter as a surrogate, Martin couldn't help but think that this was one of the doctor's famously atypical chat-up lines. He imagined Dr Sorensen and Lucy wearing their own shits as dildos, penetrating one another's every orifice in the name of biotic restoration. But Lucy, she didn't take shit from anyone, not metaphorically, nor as a saline diluted liquid excrement solution administered via an enema. But enema is not the plural of enemy, is it, of course? Dr Sorensen is one of the couple's most loyal companions. 
who's harmless really, a born-again Buddhist whose favourite chat-up line is the bizarre one-liner, you're so divine that I want to be reincarnated as your child. Right now, Lucy and Martin are frustrated with him though, because they know that he has access to far more sophisticated biotech than pumping them with his own poo, and, and what they really want is a cure for their feeling that they've taken the wrong evolutionary path. Both of them seek to return to a prior tendril of the Darwinian roadmap, Martin to the sea and Lucy to the savannah so that they can surf the DNA trails more authentically going forward. A phrase they both abhor going forward, because for them, forwards means backwards. For a flicker, Lucy wondered if she was being written into some budget spin-off of Back to the Future, possibly a porno version passed around on DVD by naughty's public school boys who will one day be in Parliament. Had things got too meta, though, too postmodern? Postmodernity is something that only dog beds and cat habitats aspire to these days. But Lucy can't stand pets. Alarm bells had rung when Martin had given her a cat shaped engagement ring, which doubled as a self defence tool so that she could kill an attacker by punching them with the feline ear spikes. It was all they'd had at the Ohio prepper and survivalist show that Martin had visited. Lucy felt her soul was that of an extinct hominin who'd lived between 3.9 and 2.9 million years ago in the savannah. She loved the sand the way that Martin loved the grains of the marine interstitium. After meeting at a fintech conference, they'd gone off-grid to tour the world's best beaches on his all-glass yacht, but the honeymoon period didn't last long. Both were dissatisfied. Martin had always felt a deeper calling, below 4,000 metres to be precise. Lucy had her feet firmly on the ground, however, and she called a spade a spade, but preferred the old Saxon word spado and the ancient Norse term spawai, which contained an unpronounceable letter and was the brand name of the mushroom leather chair she'd bought for her half of the floating penthouse now that the couple had taken the decision to divide assets. Martin and Lucy had bought their floating property when they'd first got married. The architect had made it so that it could divide down the middle and float off in two parts in case of divorce. Despite them both being genuinely committed at the time, all the couple's furniture and possessions boasted this trait you could divide it. Everything could be literally bisected if required, except for the bottles in Martin's expansive collection of commercial water specimens. He'd recently acquired some of that Donald Trump-branded water, Trump Ice, which hit the shelves in the late 90s and featured the president surrounded by hellfire as though threatening to warm up the globe by melting the poles. The name Trump Ice ominously implying that this liquid would be what ice looked like in a future led by climate change deniers. Sylvester Stallone's Sly Water and thousands of other brands were also featured in the collection, including some luxury waters in precious cases which sell for $30,000 or 7.58 Bitcoin a pop. Since their split, Martin had anchored next door to a seasteading community off the coast of French Polynesia, founded by Patry Friedman, the grandson of the famous neoliberal economist Milton Friedman built with a huge donation from the PayPal founder Peter Thiel. Patry's plan for a floating city appeared to him as a vision at Burning Man Festival in 2000, leading him to create a water fest called Ephemerizal as a seasteading experiment and a temporary autonomous zone. Patry and Martin first met years ago while competing in the Las Vegas World Poker Series, and they're now founding a bottled water brand together as well. Kona Deep, it extracts deep water from 3,000 feet and sells it to thirsty rich people who want a heavier kind of H2O that'll fill them up when intermittently fasting. The hunter has become the faster, too fast to feed, and Patry believes he pioneered this biohack, intermittent fasting, as though claiming the intellectual property rights to Ramadan and Lent. 
Martin and Patry's main motivation with the water business is not to make money from their deep sea desalinated seawater, but rather to get people addicted to this evolutionary soup, the very stuff that once spawned life, in order to pave public consciousness for a new underwater city the pair are planning. Martin is designing a limited edition bottle based on the holy water products in his collection, many of which he'd bought off eBay and intercepted as their freight barges passed his marine residence because, ironically, they wouldn't ship water to the sea. Their oceanic drink will have the tagline In Deep Water splashed across the bottle, tapping into consumers' prevailing sense that something's about to go wrong with the world. Apocalypse sells, Patry exclaims, while browsing a coffee table book about L.A. billionaires' doomsday bunkers. Lucy is now living on dry land. She's had her half of the water mansion transported to a desert outpost somewhere between that derelict Prada store created by the artists Elm Green and Dragset and that 12-metre neon bunny billboard installed by Playboy magazine. If the Prada store hadn't been decimated by activists the day after it opened, perhaps it would now be stocked with this season's protection clothing trend. Coats that look like makeshift shelters, metallic heat-resistant balaclavas and pollution-filtering face masks, all of which you might expect to find at Dr Sorensen's genetic engineering lab, or inside NASA, or at the morgue. Lucy and Martin will visit a Los Angeles cryonic morgue next month, the same place where they got married eight years ago. This had been the only venue that they could tie the knot in their present life as well as all the future cryogenic extensions and rebirths of their lives simultaneously. They'd had to repeat the vows in the bridal march 15 times at increasing speeds to ensure their union also applied to incarnations beyond this realm. And now they'll have to reverse the whole process, of course, which involves saying the vows backwards and marching in reverse down the aisle 15 times in front of all their friends to ensure that they are fully cryo-divorced as well as normal divorced. This time Lucy won't wear that official Disney princess wedding dress as she prefers to dress naked nowadays. For many years she wanted to try one of London's nudist bars or nudist club nights, but Martin is a bit of a prude and has never felt very comfortable being human-shaped. The unmarrying ceremony will be conducted by PayPal billionaire Peter Thiel, who founded the cryo chapel that it's taking place in as part of his mission to solve the problem of death. Instead of Bibles, a biotech Baptist will read sermons from the cult cyberpunk novel Cryptonomicon by Neil Stevenson. Teal prefers capitalist Star Wars to communist Star Trek, and he's also fond of bragging that four of the six principal PayPal founders had built bombs in high school, allegedly, like early Meninists in a manosphere of insurgent beta males rebelling against jocks, cheerleaders, and anyone who intentionally spells the word women, W-I-M-I-N, to be radical. But Lucy is trying not to think about the impending cryo-nuptial reversal. She's sitting on cracked desert mud in the desert, clutching an iPad with a cracked desert mud effect cover, reading an article titled Cops Confiscate Nicolas Cage's Skull, while taking a break from mixing her own desert mud, which she's selling on Amazon in potted form, and as tablets for those who want to restore their ancient paleo gut biome. What a relief it would be to have one's skull confiscated like Nicolas Cage, she thought. She's got too many thoughts. She believes that what makes millennials like her and Gen Zers so anxious is that their DNA has gone through too many ancestral iterations, too many rough self-replications, and each brings with it residual memories of the last model, meaning that these newest generations have exceeded the human brain's deep biodata threshold or something. This is why Lucy favours a simple desert lifestyle away from modern distractions, occasionally treating herself to one of her signature primitive manicure designs, made world famous through her Paleo Nails vlog. Furry ones. Teeth ones. And giant claws. 
She is sighing into the dust of the West Texan Chihuahuan desert, realising that it's not Nicolas Cage's own skull that's been seized, but that of the Cretaceous T-Rex he bought for tax breaks and giggles. Lucy felt like Martin was a dinosaur sometimes. He was older than her, born in the 70s. While taking the How Millennial Are You quiz in Practical Paleo magazine, Martin admitted not caring for live music experiences. For him, BTS, NCT and EXO are not popular K-pop bands, but enterprises he's recently invested in. BTS is the firm of global business consultants who help him with strategy execution, and NCT is a new cognitive training course that his old friend Paul Cousins is leading at Citibank, and EXO serves his corporate infrastructure needs and gave him that stress squeezer with the phrase Entropy is a ruthless enemy written on it in an inappropriately chatty font. Martin is fond of a well-designed novelty stress squeezer like the best of us, but he doesn't have nostalgia for haptic embodiment the way his younger colleagues do. He doesn't crave slime vlogs, beanbags, painful cacti, bouncy in-office basketball courts, crisp and cereal-themed restaurants, ball pits or Lego. He doesn't subscribe to his own circadian at a nap bar or sleep gym, or need an app to tell him how to chew or fart. He does not want monkey bars in his office so that he can swing around like a chimp. Martin isn't keen on Darwinism anyway. He's fonder of Nietzsche's version of the concept of eternal recurrence, the idea that with infinite time and a finite number of events, events will recur again and again infinitely, as explained in Nietzsche's book, The Gay Science. Despite the book having nothing to do with homosexuality, Martin is not yet comfortable enough to read The Gay Science in public. He has nothing against the gays, but he doesn't want to look like one, does he? Lucy, however, is a lot more sexually fluid, and she's begun a long-distance relationship with Mirella Faraz, 34 years old, Brazil's first professional mermaid a pioneer of the Mer lifestyle who is continuously spouting the claim that she became a full-time demi-fish at a time when nobody else wore a tail. She was a fish before it was cool, that's what she's saying. What was it with Lucy's attraction to nautical types? Martin Shipman doesn't need a tail, though. Dr Sorensen is grafting him a transparent skull like the deep-sea spookfish whose tubular eyes pivot under a clear dome. Soon everyone will want one. The double-glazing guy selling conservatories from a little pulpit at the exit of B&Q. He'll be doing deals on optocranial extensions. Giant corneas will become the norm retrospectively justifying the massive eyebrow movement of 2018.